Hello everyone, welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today we're doing the Q&A video for idea number 12, which was scale, where we talked about the size of things. I had hoped to get a lot farther because the size of things is a big topic, ironically enough. But uh, the questions today were actually very good, so I'm not gonna try to extend what I did in the video. I'm just gonna go through the questions. Some of them were things that I should have thought of to answer. Others were um, ones that I wanted to get to but didn't quite have time. So the first one is one I definitely should have thought of to answer. It's a classic question. We talk a lot in the last video about the Compton wavelength of a particle. And the question is simply, what is the difference between the Compton wavelength and the de Broglie wavelength, which we talked about earlier? So the de Broglie wavelength came about early in the days. Uh, actually, it might have been around the same time when the Compton wavelength and the de Broglie wavelength came about, but both of them were before quantum mechanics had been completely formulated in its final form. So a bunch of concepts come in and only later on do we figure out what they're good for. So the de Broglie wavelength, uh, lambda, uh, lambda de Broglie, there you go. The equation for it is just H, I'm gonna put Planck's constant in here, over the momentum of the particle or in the non-relativistic regime, where we don't need to worry about special relativity, et cetera, it's h over the mass times the velocity. And the point of this was, roughly speaking, de Broglie was saying, it wasn't the wavelength that was important. What mattered was, he was saying that matter has wave-like properties. This was the first explicit statement of that idea. Remember, you had the Bohr atom, where you had quantized energy levels in the orbits of electrons around nuclei, but the idea that the reason why the orbits were quantized is because the electrons are fundamentally wave-like had not yet appeared. And here's de Broglie saying exactly that. And this is the wavelength corresponding to a particle with a certain momentum, okay? Compare that to the wavelength of a photon before we get to the Compton wavelength. This is what came out of Planck's original idea in 1905. He said that um, we all know that photons have wavelengths. We didn't know there were, sorry, we didn't know there were photons back in the year 1900. We knew there was light. We knew that light had a wavelength. And what Planck did was to say that the light is coming, or at least is emitted, in these quanta of energy. And then it was Einstein who said that the reason why light was emitted in quanta of energy is because light is, in some sense, quanta of energy. What we would say now is that light is the vibrations in the quantum electromagnetic field, and when you observe it, when you measure it, when it interacts with something and decoheres, you measure it in discrete chunks of energy. And so what uh, Planck would have said anyway, wrapping all that up into a formula for the wavelength versus the momentum, Planck would have said that uh, it's just H divided by P. I don't know why I'm thinking so hard about this. It's exactly the same formula as the de Broglie wavelength. This is, this is the point. Uh, let, let's call this the Planck. No, I can't call it the Planck wavelength, can I? That's something else. Let's call it the photon, lambda gamma, okay? Gamma being the photon, lambda being the wavelength. This was how de Broglie got his formula. We had known from Planck that an individual particle could be associated with a certain amount of energy and momentum, an individual particle of light, which we now call the photon, and this was the relationship between the wavelength of the classical electromagnetic wave and the little individual particle that has an energy and a momentum, okay? Finally, we can compare that to the Compton wavelength, which we introduced in the scale video, Lambda Compton, and this is H over M, the mass of the particle, okay? So we can see something from these equations, just from the mathematical form of them, a relationship between these different notions of the idea of a wavelength. The photon wavelength is the wavelength of a particle with zero mass, a photon moving at the speed of light. We express it in terms of the momentum. The way that Planck would have written it was H over E, the energy, but the energy is equal to momentum for a particle moving at the speed of light, okay? So when de Broglie wanted to invent a formula for the wavelength of a matter particle, he just used the same formula that Planck had given for the photon, but he used the momentum, okay? And then we see from comparing the de Broglie wavelength to the Compton wavelength, that the de Broglie wavelength is just the Compton wavelength divided by the velocity. And even though I'm putting in Planck's constant here, I'm still setting C equals one, the speed of light equals one. So this is always greater than the Compton wavelength, okay? The de Broglie wavelength is always greater than the Compton wavelength. Fine, but what are they? Like, what do they physically mean, okay? 
Well, I think that the secret here is, and I've never quite seen this written down uh, or expressed in this way, so maybe some experts on the history of quantum mechanics will correct me, but in my mind, the point of the Compton wavelength is not the wavelength. It's not a wavelength of anything in some sense. The Compton wavelength is a scale. It's a distance. It's the distance at which given quantum mechanics and relativity, it's the smallest scale at which you can sensibly talk about a single particle at a time. It's sort of the intrinsic size of the particle, although there's a footnote there we'll get to later. Lambda c, the Compton wavelength, is the smallest scale for a particle. And it's not necessarily the scale at which quantum mechanics kicks in. It's the scale at which quantum mechanics cannot help but kick in. That's the point. The de Broglie wavelength is the actual quantum scale, quantum wavelength of the particle. It really is a wavelength. So there was an experiment done uh, by Davison and Germer in around 1920. Did I write it down? No, I didn't. Uh, in the 1920s, they did an experiment where they actually showed, I think in 1927, um, where they actually did the interference experiment. You know, we talked about the double slit experiment. The double slit experiment is usually given as a way of thinking about measurement and what it means and interference of what it means. But it was Davison and Germer who actually showed that if you have an electron or a set of electrons, they will interfere with each other just like waves do and from that interference pattern, you can figure out what the wavelength is, and it's the de Broglie wavelength. It's the actual wavelength of the wave function oscillating up and down for that particle. So, of course, it makes sense. The de Broglie wavelength must be larger than the Compton wavelength because the Compton wavelength is just the size smaller than which quantumness takes over. In fact, you can't even say it's just a single particle anymore. If you squeeze down the uncertainty in the position of the wave in the quantum fields to less than the Compton wavelength, you're not even talking about a single particle anymore. Whereas when you're larger than the Compton wavelength, when your wave has a wavelength larger than that, then number one, you can talk about a single particle. And number two, you can do the experiment to have them interfere. And that's an actual honest to goodness wavelength you're talking about there. So they mean different things. The Compton wavelength is really, you know, it's, it's kind of a more fundamental thing. As you can see, the Compton wavelength just depends on the mass of the particle. Since we're setting h equal to one, you could equally well write this as one over m depending on where you want to put the two pi's. Uh, the smaller the mass, the larger the Compton wavelength, larger the mass, the smaller the Compton wavelength. This is where you cannot help but pay attention to quantum mechanics. But the point being, even for a very, very massive particle, where the Compton wavelength is very small, and therefore you can imagine a state in which the wavelength was confined to that region, you can also imagine states in which the particles all spread out. And that would be when the de Broglie wavelength is very large. So I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, here's a related question. Are particles, or elementary particles, if you like, really point-like? Hmm. This is a tough question, actually. So sometimes you hear people talk about, you know, the proton, which is made of quarks and gluons, is not a point-like particle, right? Because it's made of other things rattling around in there. Whereas the electron is a point-like particle. That is what you will hear. Um, but we just talked about all these different wavelengths that it has. You know, the, there's a Compton wavelength below which it's intrinsically quantum. Is there any sense at all in which a particle is point-like at all? I think, you know, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> My favorite short answer is no, because the world's not made of particles. The world's made of quantum fields, as far as we know. And those quantum fields are vibrating. There's nothing point-like about them. They have an extent. And even if they were particles, even if the quantum theory of the world was obtained by starting with particles and quantizing them, it would still be a quantum theory. It would still be a wave function. Okay? There's nothing point-like about it. When people say that the electron seems to be point-like, what they mean is, as far as we can tell, there's no substructure to the electron. The electron is not made of other things. Of course, it could be. We don't think it is, honestly. Most of us don't. But it could be made of other things. But there's no evidence that it is. So point-like is just a shorthand for saying not made of smaller things. It does not mean you can actually shrink the wave function of the electron down to a point. You can't really sensibly shrink it down smaller than the Compton wavelength. I mean, you could, but then it wouldn't be an electron anymore. Okay, next question. Um, this is, and this is sort of, 
I'm cheating by allowing a question that was more appropriate for a previous video, but that's okay. It, it relates to these questions. Um, if you say that the energy of a photon is H Planck's constant times the frequency, okay, which we do, we just did, um, where where is the amplitude in that formula? <laughs> Why doesn't the amplitude of the wave matter? Why is it just the frequency that matters, okay? Uh, and this is, of course, a very important question. I could have talked about it earlier, but uh, I mean, maybe I even did allude to it, but this is where quantum mechanics comes in. So the, the status of the question, the context of the question is, we're saying that there are waves. We're saying that, you know, photons are coming from waves in the electromagnetic field, but they have certain particle-like properties. And this equation here, the answer to this question is this equation is for one photon, a single photon corresponding to a wavelength of light or frequency of light given by F has an energy given by this formula. That's what this formula means. The point is if you change the amplitude, what that changes is the number of photons, the amplitude of the wave. And this is very roughly speaking because again, we're really dealing with quantum mechanical wave functions, not classical waves, but roughly speaking, the amplitude corresponds to the number of photons. And we can even think, since we've already done our quantum field theory uh, introduction, we, we understand that at a little more sophisticated level. The electromagnetic wave bouncing up and down is kind of like a simple harmonic oscillator, okay? So it will always be bouncing up and down a little bit. There's always some tail. The wave function of the wave always has some support at very, very large amplitudes. But for one particle states, for the minimum excitation of that simple harmonic oscillator, the typical oscillation, the typical amplitude is not very large. As you excite the field more and more, as you introduce more and more particles, the typical amplitude of oscillation goes up. That's where the amplitude comes in. And this is, you know, historically, this is a crucially important insight. There's something called the photoelectric effect. And this is actually the explanation for which this is what Einstein wrote about in 1905, where he essentially introduced the idea of the photon, even though he didn't call it that yet. And this is the paper that he won the Nobel Prize for, despite also completing special relativity in 1905. So the point was this. You can, there's a certain kind of metal that you can shine light on, and occasionally the metal will kick off an electron. An electron will leave the metal because you're shining light on it. You're just shaking loose an electron. Not surprising. The question is, when does the electron, when do the electrons get shaken free? So you might think that what matters is the intensity of the light, right? The brightness of the light. The more light you're shining on it, the more electrons get shaken free. But that is not what is observed. If you do a very, very faint amount of light, you might be able to shake an electron free. What matters is not the intensity, but the color of the light, the frequency of the wave, right? The wavelength. If you go to blue or violet or ultraviolet, those have the ability to shake loose electrons. And that's true even when it's very faint, as well as when it's very, very bright. Whereas very red light or infrared light will not shake loose electrons, no matter how bright it is. Okay, And so this was the idea. In fact, before quantum mechanics came along, people had exactly this idea. The more bright a beam of light is, the more energy it has, the easier it should have the ability to shake electrons free. But when you think of that light, instead of as waves, as individual particles hitting the, the uh, metal, being observed by the metal, if you like, then this formula kicks in. So a bright beam of red light is a huge number of photons, but that are very, very individually, very, very low energy. None of those photons has enough energy to break loose an electron. Whereas a beam of blue light, I don't actually know what the actual colors or wavelengths are, but a higher, uh, shorter wavelength of beam of light, let's put it that way, it can be very faint, but those photons individually pack a lot of energy. So it just being very faint just means there aren't a lot of photons. So you won't shock loose a lot of electrons, but even a very faint beam of blue light can break loose a couple of electrons. That's the difference. The wavelength tells you the energy of the individual photons. The amplitude tells you how many photons there are. So they both go into telling you how energetic that beam of light really is. Okay, um, here's a related question on our little plot. Okay, you know, we had the plot of energies 
and we went from 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 6 electron volts up to the Planck scale, 10 to the 27 electron volts. Okay, so one question was, where are photons on that? Well, there's a good reason why photons were not there, because we were actually not plotting the energy of particles, we were plotting the mass of particles. We were using the fact that mass and energy are the same, the same units when you set c equal to 1. So a photon which is low frequency, long wavelength, can have an arbitrarily small amount of energy per photon. A photon with a very short wavelength, a very high frequency, will have an arbitrarily large amount of energy per photon. So on this plot, am I doing this correctly? Yes, look at that. On this scale, photons are everywhere, depending on the energy of the photon. Nevertheless, it might be interesting to plot some representative interesting photon energies that you might know about. Um, so let's go to, you know, um, one electron volt, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. Remember, um, the mass of the electron is about uh, 500,000 electron volts. Okay, so a little bit here. So maybe here is the mass of the electron. And what you could do is look up the electromagnetic spectrum that goes from you know radio waves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays, and you could plot it. You could just convert from whatever they give you the units in, you know, the wavelength of the light in angstroms or whatever, to electron volts. That's something you can do at home. So I'm not going to do the whole thing, but here's sort of some typical numbers. You know where we are. Visible light is roughly here, okay, between one and ten electron volts. Visible light, literally what is visible to our eyeballs. Whereas X-rays are maybe between uh, 1 and 100,000 electron volts. So in between, there's ultraviolet. Over here, there's infrared, etc. Okay, So different photons have different amounts of energy. But what you see is all of these photons that you're used to have energies that are lower than the energy in a single electron, right? So when an electron and a positron come together to annihilate into photons, they will be typically giving off, that doesn't say me, that says mass of the electron, they will be tipping, typically giving off gamma rays. Gamma rays are the next highest in energy after that. And these words, you know, infrared, visible, UV, X-ray, gamma ray, these are not physics words. I mean, they may be used by physicists, but there's no physical distinction between these photons other than their energies, other than their wavelengths, okay? They're just photons of different energies. So that's where photons fit on the plot. And of course, you can go, you could imagine having Planck energy photons. Um, Maybe you could have higher than Planck energy photons. Who knows? We don't know the laws of physics up there, the Planck scale, so we're not sure. But the point is, the mass of even an electron, which is sort of the smallest particle that makes up you, is still pretty massive compared to the photons that you're looking at. It would take a lot of photons to make up one electron. Then there's a related question. Here's another fun one that I, that I could have mentioned once again. What about the quarks? Where are they? <laughs> because we mentioned the electron 500,000 electron volts in energy, uh, in mass. We mentioned the proton and the neutron. So let, let me write that down. Mass of the electron is around five times 10 to the five electron volts. Mass of the proton, which is about the same as the mass of the neutron, that's about 10 to the nine electron volts, one GeV. So that's why you get GeVs as very, very common units in particle physics. So what about the quarks? You might think, it would be perfectly natural to think, that given that there are three quarks in a proton or a neutron, that the mass of a typical quark is about one-third of the mass of the proton or the neutron. We're not going to explain why just yet. We'll get there pretty soon, actually. Um, but in fact, quarks are much lighter than protons and neutrons. At least some quarks are. The quarks that are inside the protons and neutrons are much lighter than them. So here are the answers. There's six quarks. Uh, up quarks have masses of about 2 times 10 to the 6th electron volts, whereas down quarks have masses of around 5 times 10 to the 6th electron volts. Uh, I'll tell you what the others are in a second, but let me just pause to notice here, the up quark and the down quark are only a little bit heavier than the electron, right? Uh, an up quark is about 4 times the mass of the electron, whereas the down quark is about 10 times the mass of the electron compared to protons and neutrons, which are about 2,000 times the mass of the electron. So up and down quarks are not that heavy, 
the mass of the proton and the mass of the neutron, which is where most of your mass comes from, because you're made of atoms, and atoms are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and protons and neutrons have most of the mass in them, most of the mass in you does not come from those quarks. Where it comes from is the interaction energy of the gluons that are holding the quarks together in a complicated way. We have to try to explain that a little bit, but it's not the masses of the up and down quarks themselves. In fact, these numbers that I'm giving you here are a little problematic because when you talk about the mass of something, you wanna isolate it from everything else and put it on a scale or you know push it and use F equals MA or something like that. But as we'll talk about for quarks, you cannot isolate them from everything else. Quarks are confined. You can have an up quark inside a proton or a neutron, but you can't have one all by itself outside. So in a very real sense, the very notion of the mass of an up quark or a down quark isn't even really well defined. It's these complications that made me hesitant to even mention this in the first place. Uh, but that's okay, we'll just put it there. There's also the strange quark. That's the next heaviest. It's about 10 to the eighth electron volts. There's the charm quark which is about 10 to the nine. The bottom, which is about four times 10 to the nine electron volts. And of course the top quark is a big leap upward. It's about 10 to the 11 electron volts. So the charm quark, the fourth heaviest quark, is about the mass of a proton, right? It's about one GeV. And the bottom and top quarks are much heavier than that. Uh, as we said, as I said in the previous video, when you have these heavier particles, they tend to decay away. It is a process of entropy increasing, because when a heavy particle decays into lighter ones, there are more lighter particles than there were heavy ones, and therefore there's more stuff going on, and therefore the entropy is higher. Someone asked in the question, you know, why do we have heavy particles? Uh, we don't have heavy particles. There's no top quarks lying around. There's no Higgs boson lying around. Particles decay until they reach decay products that are stable. The electron, the proton, and the photon, and the neutrinos, those are stable particles. They have nowhere to go. Of course, the proton is still pretty heavy, but it carries what, what is called baryon number. It's a conserved quantity. Baryon number is not created or destroyed in any experiment we've ever seen. And therefore, the proton has nowhere to go. It can't decay into anything lighter because it is the lightest particle carrying baryon number. Likewise, electrons and positrons are the lightest particles carrying electric charge, so they can't decay either. Uh, neutrinos are the lightest particles carrying fermion number, the total number of fermions, etc. So basically that's the story in particle physics. Things decay until they're in the lightest possible state that has some conserved quantity that you can't get rid of, so it makes you stable, and then you're stuck there. Now there's a little... Um, Footnote there, because of course we have things like the helium nucleus or the iron nucleus or the carbon nucleus, which are stable mixtures of neutrons and protons. A neutron all by itself out there in the wild can decay. A neutron will decay into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. But because of the dynamics of the strong interactions in the quarks, certain combinations of neutrons and protons become stable, even though individual neutrons by themselves are not. Thank goodness, because that's the origin of the periodic table of the elements, which is kind of a big deal. Okay, all of this is just to say um, the quarks have a wide range of masses, and their masses are not sort of easily interpretable in any way, because the quarks are stuck inside protons and neutrons and other strongly interacting particles. Okay, here's another good question. This is a fun question, actually. Um, can you, what about if you had hydrogen, so you have proton and electron, but you tried to replace the electron with a muon instead. The muon is just a heavier particle, a heavier cousin of the electron. Could you make muonic hydrogen? It's a clever question. Uh, yes, you can. You can You can try to make it. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been made. They've done all sorts of crazy things. This is a fun uh, thing for physicists to try to do. The important thing that I want to mentioned is that the mass of the muon, again, the properties of the muon are exactly the same as the properties of the electron except for its mass. So it has charge minus one, just like the electron does. It has spin one half. It has an antiparticle called the antimuon, etc. Um, in fact, there was a, a point of time when the only known elementary particles were the electron, the proton, and the neutron. Okay, these are the first three that we found. And then it was like literally a few meters away from my office at Caltech where Carl Anderson, by building a big 
cloud chamber and looking at cosmic rays coming from the sky, he discovered the positron, the anti-electron, and then he discovered the muon, and he discovered the anti-muon. So the positron shook people up because antiparticles were not yet accepted. They'd been predicted by Dirac, but people didn't know whether to take that prediction seriously. The muon was a complete surprise. No one knew that. This is that was the origin of the famous comment by I.I. Uh, I. Robbie, who said, who ordered that? when the muon was discovered. But the point of the anecdote is there was a little moment of time when Carl Anderson had discovered the positron, the muon, and the anti-muon, and the only other known particles were the electron, the proton, and the neutron. So he discovered half of the elementary particles that were known at the time, which is pretty good. He deserved and he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, ask yourselves why he discovered the positron, the muon, and the anti-muon before the anti-proton and the anti-neutron. I won't tell you, but you can figure it out given things we've already said. Anyway, the mass of the muon is about 200 times the mass of the electron. So the point is you can make uh, uh, an atom. So you have, here's a proton, P, and then orbiting around it, we'll do our little trick where we do a, oops, that's not right. We'll do our little trick where we color in to give the impression of a wave function, okay? There you go. So this is the wave function of the muon now. Uh, mu minus. But the point is the size of the muonic atom, the equivalent of the Bohr radius, remember the Bohr radius gives you the size of the hydrogen atom, the ordinary hydrogen atom. So this is only going to be one two hundredth of the Bohr radius. It's going to be a much more compact atom because the muon is heavier. So when I said, you know, Ant-Man is impossible, um, the point of that was you can't squeeze things down to really tiny distances. Of course, the one way you can is by making them heavier, right? You can't keep the mass of the electron what it is and squeeze it down below its Compton wavelength. But the muon is heavier, so it is smaller. So you can make smaller things out of muons, and people have. The problem is the muon also has a lifetime. It is not a stable particle because it can decay into electrons. In fact, the muon can decay into an electron plus two neutrinos, a neutrino and an antineutrino. And the lifetime of the muon is about 10 to the minus six seconds, one millisecond. So that's not good. You're not gonna get a lot of stable structures that you're gonna make out of muons and other things. Um, nevertheless, you know, physicists are ambitious sometimes. You might know that we have the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. Before that, we had the Tevatron at Fermilab, and we're still thinking about what the next big collider will be. So here's an idea. You know, so sorry. Let me let me back that up. Um, there's roughly speaking two different kinds of particle colliders that people like to build: hadron colliders and lepton colliders. So hadrons are the protons and neutrons, um, nuclei that you can make out of them. Leptons are electrons, basically electrons and positrons, etc. Hadrons also include antiprotons. So uh, Fermilab had the Tevatron, where they were colliding protons and antiprotons. The SSC, the, sorry, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, is just protons and protons. They could do antiprotons, but it's hard to make them. So you're going to get more collisions if you just make protons hit protons. So that's that's why they did that. Um, but there's also, and, and the reason why you want to do these hadron colliders, these proton antiproton colliders, is because they're heavier than electrons. You can get up to very high energies. So if you're trying to make the Higgs boson or some other new particles or whatever, you want to get as much energy into a tiniest space as possible. Heavy particles are good for that because they have a smaller Compton wavelength, right? Um, but once you've discovered them, you might want to do very delicate measurements. You might want to figure out exactly what the mass of the Higgs boson is and exactly all of its decay products and things like that. That's harder to do at a hadron collider. It's not impossible. We've done it to some uh, precision, but you can do it more precisely by colliding electrons or electrons and positrons together because they're exactly because they're smaller and they are, as far as we know, fundamental particles. I said they're smaller, they're not smaller. Because they're fundamental particles, because they're not made up of other things, you know, two protons hitting each other, you don't know exactly where the energy is, if it's in this quark or that quark or a gluon or whatever. Whereas in an electron, you know exactly where the energy is, an electron and a positron, for example. So there's a good reason to still build electron or lepton colliders, even though you can get more energy out of a hadron collider. So, Check it out. 
you could build a muon collider. And this is a very active idea. People are thinking about this because muons have 200 times the mass, therefore 200 times the energy of an electron. And so you could get some of the benefit of smashing protons together, namely you get heavy particles and a lot of energy, but also some of the benefit of smashing electrons together, that they are fundamental particles, so you know what all the energy is doing. This is the problem. This is why it's, it is so far proven impractical to do this, because the individual muons decay in a millionth of a second. Now, you can, to a large extent, combat that by just having the muons move very fast. You can use relativity, right? If the muons are moving at 99.999% the speed of light, then it seems to us that they live a lot longer than a millionth of a second. And that's the trick. That's how you can try to get a muon collider. But even at that, look, at a particle accelerator, you're not just keeping two muons or one muon and one anti-muon and colliding them together. You're generally getting millions or billions or trillions or much more than that, colliding them together in bunches and hoping to get some good, interesting collisions out of them. So when you get that many muons together, some of them are going to decay, even if they're all moving very close to the speed of light. And when they decay, they give off these very high energy electrons, but also neutrinos that can pass right through matter usually, but then they also hit you. So this, there was this idea that a muon collider with a lot of muons, with, you know, 10 to the 20 muons in it, would be constantly radiating super high energy particles and give rise to what was called the ring of death. <laughs> Everyone near the collider would be killed by this high energy radiation. So that was an engineering problem that also people have not yet uh, overcome, as far as I know. I mean, maybe they've overcome it. They certainly haven't built a muon collider yet. Okay, that was, you know, that was a digression, but it's a fun digression. Um, what next? Uh, just two more questions that I wanted to get to. One question is, can there be unknown, yet as yet undiscovered, low energy particles, low mass particles? The idea of this question, which is a perfectly good question, is, uh, look, it's hard to make the Higgs boson, hard to make the top quark, hard to make particles even heavier than that because E equals mc squared. You need energy in a tiny region to make these new particles. But an axion, um, these hypothetical particles that I mentioned, might have masses of like 10 to the minus four electron volts, incredibly, incredibly tiny, right? Um, it can't be that hard to make them. Well, so I'm not going to talk too much about what axions are. Um, neutrinos, by the way, also, m nu, might have energies around 10 to minus 3 or 10 to minus 2 electron volts. So, and neutrinos have the benefit of actually existing, but the point is we discovered neutrinos. Why haven't we discovered axions if they're so light and easy to make? We might not have discovered them because they don't exist, we're not sure yet, but you don't need just to be able to make them, you be able to, need to be able to make enough of them to notice. So the axion in particular is a neutral particle. It has zero electric charge. That's what makes it a good candidate to be the dark matter. Dark matter is dark. Dark means you don't interact with photons, okay? If you have a charged dark matter particle, you know, look, people are clever and they try those things, but the simplest thing in the world, the most obvious guess is the dark matter is electrically neutral. And the axions don't feel the weak nuclear force or the strong nuclear force. They, they feel electromagnetism in a weird off-kilter indirect way, so it is possible to try to detect them, but those interactions are very, very, very weak. So typically, axions are one of these things, much like neutrinos, where axions could be in the room all around you right now, going through your body, and you would never know. So the reason why there could be low mass particles we haven't yet detected is our ability to create them depends on their mass, but our ability to know we've created them, to detect them, uh, and to see them taking away energy and momentum depends on their coupling, depends on the strength of their interaction. And so if someone says they have a new candidate for dark matter or whatever, or just some particle they made up, which has a mass less than the mass of a proton or less than the mass of the electron for that matter, you can immediately assume that those particles are very, very weakly interacting. They're just hard to know that they're there. The neutrino, very famously, uh, was suggested by Wolfgang Pauli because of, uh, I think it was beta decay. It was certainly um, energy conservation issues. Beta decay is neutron. We already discussed this. Neutron goes into proton. Uh, plus, let me just write plus, electron plus, as we now know, an electron anti-neutrino. Uh, 
So if momentum is conserved, the neutron has a momentum, the proton has a momentum, the electron has a momentum, and those proton and neutron momenta, you can add them up and you can ask, is the momentum of the outgoing proton and electron equal to the momentum of the neutron? And the answer was no. So obviously there's another particle taking away some of the energy, some of the momentum. But back in the day, like these days, you know, the standards are a lot looser now than they used to be. Everyone would just say, sure, there's a new particle. That would be instantly what people said. Back in the 1930s, people were much more reluctant to just predict new particles that had never been uh, observed. So Wolfgang Pauli was the one who said, you know, maybe we should take this energy thing seriously. And look, people were saying things like maybe energy is not conserved, right? That was on the table as a possible uh, prediction. But instead, Pauli said, maybe there's a new particle, but he's very embarrassed about it. He said like, you know, you know, don't, don't be mad at me, which is which is ironic because everyone knew that Pauli was the harshest person on everyone else when they, whenever they made new predictions for things. But he turned out to be right, one of many things that Pauli was right about. Uh, so there can be low mass particles as long as they interact weakly. The neutron, neutrino rather, does interact very weakly, literally through the weak interactions. It took us a while to detect it directly. Okay, the final set of questions was, what I don't know if it's a set of questions or not, but it had to do with grand unified theories. So I mentioned grand unified theories because they might be right. You know, grand unified theories, we, we have this situation right now where electromagnetism definitely exists, figured out classically by Maxwell in the 19th century, quantum mechanically by, I think it was Dirac who first started down the road, but people like Feynman, Schwiger, and Tomonaga showed it how to make it a consistent quantum theory. Then there's the weak interactions, uh, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, was the first person to come up with a sensible theory of the weak interactions. And then it was unified by Weinberg, Salam, and Glashow into the electroweak theory. There's a complicated story of uh, why three people get credit for it. They never wrote a paper together. <laughs> but um, let's see, can I do this? What am I doing here? Yeah. But uh, I think Weinberg sort of got it right. Let's say that. Um, and this is very successful. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on there. But then you also have the strong interactions. So once this works, once this trick works of unifying the electromagnetic and weak interactions into electroweak, it is natural to say, let's unify strong and, ele and electroweak into grand unified theories. Okay. So the question, I'm not even sure that's how the question was asked. Sorry for the people who are uh, asking this question, but it brings up two issues that were talked about. One issue is that grand unified theories predict proton decay. So I think what it was was I mentioned proton decay and people said, why would the proton ever decay? I just mentioned a few minutes ago, there's this quantity called baryon number, which is conserved. So protons can't decay. So if protons can decay, then that means the baryon number is not exactly conserved. And this is a feature that was figured out in the 1970s when Glashow and Howard Georgi first suggested grand unification. They're unifying the weak interactions with the strong interactions, but they don't just unify the forces, they unify the matter as well. They unify the electrons and the neutrinos, which we now call leptons, with the quarks, okay? So in that, Basically, there are new forces of nature that are very, very weak because the bosons carrying them are very, very heavy that can turn an electron or rather a quark into an electron or vice versa, that, that can somehow couple um, the baryon number carrying things, namely the quarks, to things without baryon number, namely electrons and neutrinos. And then you can go through. This is one of the you know fun, interesting um, anecdotes in the history of science, you could go through in the 1970s and you could say, knowing what we know about grand unification, uh, it, it needs to have an energy scale something like 10 to the 16 GeV, okay? 10 to the 25 electron volts, just a little bit below the Planck scale. So number one, that's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting that it's within spitting distance of the Planck scale because gravity is where the Planck scale comes from and gravity didn't get mentioned here. Okay, so this was a, and this is a big deal. This was you know, one of the reasons why people took grand unification so seriously. The data you have in the 1970s is all from experiments done at uh, some numbers of GeV, right? You know, the mass of the proton or 10 or 100 times the mass of the proton. But you can use that data and this theoretical idea to extrapolate to a new energy scale, 
where grand unification should happen? And the answer is it happens very close to the Planck scale. A factor of 100 is nothing in this game, right? So that was that just seemed like an accident. That seemed like a coincidence. And maybe it is, because maybe grand unification isn't right. But at the time, that was taken as very suggestive. And exactly because that energy scale is so large, the bosons carrying this new force would be very, very heavy, hard to make, and therefore the interactions they mediate are very rare. And therefore, protons will decay very, very rarely. So in another coincidence, they could figure out how long it would take a proton to decay in their theory, and they made a prediction. And beautifully, the prediction was, I forget exactly the number, but the lifetime for a proton and grand unification might be something like 10 to the 35 years. Um, compared to the lifetime of the universe, <laughs> right now is around 10 to the 10 years. So you might think, well, that's hopeless. You're never gonna see a decay. Uh, you have to wait around 25, 10 to the 25 times the, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have to wait around 10 to 25 times the age of the universe uh, in order for this to happen. But of course the answer is you don't wait proton by proton. You don't take one proton and wait for it to decay. You take a large number of protons. You take 10 to the 30th or 10 to the 35 or 10 to the 40 protons, right? And well, 10 to the 40 is a lot, but you take a lot of protons and wait for some of them to decay. And it turned out in the 1970s that this just about seemed doable with the technology that they had at the time. And so they built proton decay detectors and they haven't found it. That's the short answer. It's been decades now that that's been going on and they've not seen the proton decay. So the simplest versions of grand unification have been ruled out. They're just not right. Um, but of course, physicists are very clever. They have uh, assigned their ingenuity to this problem. They've come up with other versions of grand unification where the lifetime is a little bit longer and therefore you can avoid the current experiments. So then it becomes a question of how much is it worth it to you to improve the experiments? You can do the experiment better, but it costs money. And you know, in the 1970s or 80s, it was like, yeah, this is probably there, let's do it. And now it's like, maybe it's there, we don't know. So it's harder to justify spending that money. So we're not sure yet. That's the sad story. Um, the other part of the grand unification story is monopoles. So we know that electricity, I don't wanna to get too much into this, um, call it, say, electric charge, okay? Electric charge comes in plus or minus. So you have a proton positively charged, you have an electron negatively charged. Uh, magnets, on the other hand, they have north and south poles, but a magnet always has one of each. It has a north pole and a south pole. And if you were to cut the magnet in half, then this would become a south pole and that would become a north pole. Okay? You cannot separate a magnet into one pole at a time. So a magnetic monopole, when we say monopoles, we usually but not always mean magnetic monopoles, would be a particle which was just a north or just a south magnetic charge all by itself. No evidence of these existing in nature. There's, there's a joke because there's been a couple of experimental claims that people have found magnetic monopoles. Uh, most people think that those claims were just false, and the joke is no one has ever claimed to find two magnetic monopoles. <laughs> people have claimed to find one. Um, probably they just haven't found them yet. And guess what? Uh, grand unified theories predict that magnetic monopoles should exist. Um, for topological reasons, we're not gonna get into that right now, but they also predict they should have this huge energy, this huge mass. So they're impossible to make um, in particle accelerators right now. This is way, these energies are way, way higher than anything we can make in a particle accelerator. Um, however, the universe is the poor man's particle accelerator, as David Tran liked to say. If you didn't do anything weird, if you just had ordinary Big Bang cosmology, at very, very early times, the universe was super duper hot and dense, and you could make magnetic monopoles. And they would try to annihilate away, but they were not very successful. So what you could do is you could calculate if grand unified theories were correct, um, should you have leftover remnant magnetic monopoles? And the answer is yes. In fact, the total energy, the total mass in magnetic monopoles today should be something like 10 to the 10 times the actual amount of energy in the universe. The universe should be all magnetic monopoles if this theory were correct. This is what is called the monopole problem of grand unified theories. And the monopole problem was what actually inspired Alan Guth to invent, oops, 
wonderful problem to invent the inflationary universe scenario. Inflation is this idea uh, in cosmology that there was a period in the very, very early universe with a kind of temporary dark energy. Dark energy is this stuff that exists everywhere in space and is pushing the universe apart and making it accelerate. Um, but imagine that there was dark energy up at the grand unification scale, so not at the wimpy little scale that it's at today. Today, the energy scale characteristic of dark energy, E lambda, lambda is the cosmological constant, the vacuum, is something like 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. And what that means is this 10 to the minus 3 electron volts to the fourth power is the energy density of empty space today. So during inflation, what you want is the energy scale of inflation is near the gut scale, near the grand unified scale. So that's 10 to the, what do we call it, 10 to the 25 electron volts, way higher. So the point is, if there's a temporary period of dark energy, that makes the universe accelerate and it will dilute away all the magnetic monopoles. So you have a huge overabundance of magnetic monopoles and inflation can get rid of them. And then inflation turns all of this dark energy back into ordinary matter and radiation, but at a lower temperature, at a temperature low enough that it won't make any magnetic monopoles. So we can dilute away all the monopoles. Now today, we still believe in inflation. Many of us think that it's a very promising idea to discuss what happened in the early universe. We don't know. We don't know for absolutely sure. Um, I would put it at you know more than 50% chance, but not a lot more if I were forced to bet. Um, but the motivation has changed completely. So Guth's original motivation was this magnetic monopole problem. But in the back of his head, he knew there were these other problems in cosmology, what we call the horizon and flatness problems. And he showed that inflation also was a solution to those problems. And we can debate whether or not those problems are interesting. But the point is, they're still there, whereas the monopole problem depends on you really wanting grand unification to be correct. Uh, if grand unification isn't there, then there's no monopole problem. There's no mechanism for making magnetic monopoles. So monopoles are an interesting theoretical idea. Um, they cause good things and also bad things. They could um, be problematic if you, you don't have inflation, um, but they could be wonderful if you were able to detect them, right? You win the Nobel Prize for doing that. So, you know, we've, we've been introduced here in this little Q&A to a bunch of particles that we don't know whether they exist or not. The axion is one, magnetic monopoles are, are another. Um, that's the fun part about particle physics. You know, we haven't discovered a new surprising particle, one that hadn't been already predicted uh, since the 1970s, but maybe it'll happen soon. We don't know. That's what physics is all about. You got to wait, got to do your experiments, got to let nature tell you what's going on.